So did y'all know it's an election year? If you, uh, you've been outside, if you own an electronic device, you know it's an election year, right? You've seen the signs, you've seen the billboards, the posters, the ads, the graphics, the just non-stop, relentless campaigning from all of the different candidates, whether it's a, a local race or whether it's for the presidency of the United States, all these things telling us, okay, who, who you should vote for. Billions and billions are spent on these ads, these campaigns, and, and yet so many times we think there's only two options. So, so many times we think, okay, it, it's either Republican or it's Democrat, and though those may be the two main parties, political parties in America, they're not the only ones. And I was kind of blown away. I, I knew that there weren't just two, but, but I was blown away as I went back this week and I was working on this sermon and I went to the 2016 presidential election and I began to look at all of the different people and parties that received votes during that election. It was astonishing just the number of parties and number of votes some of these parties got because if you go and look, it's not just Republican and Democrat. If you look at those numbers, you also had the Libertarian Party. Many have heard of that. But you had the Vermont Progressive Party, the Independence Party, the Reform Party, the Green Party, the Conservative Party of New York State, the Constitution Party. You also had the Working Families Party, the Party for Socialism and Liberation, the Peace and Freedom Party. You had the Women's Equality Party, the Legalize Marijuana Now Party, the Socialist Workers Party, which kind of is an oxymoron to me, the American Solidarity Party, the Prohibition Party, the Workers' World Party, the Socialist Party USA, the Natural Law Party, the Liberty Union Party, and last but not least, the Transhumanist Party. Now that's a lot of parties, isn't it? Now, all of those receive some type of votes for president in the 2016 presidential election. Now there's other political parties, official political parties, but they didn't receive votes, but they had in the past, so they were listed there as well. And yet we have all of those parties that someone could be affiliated with, could vote for potentially, and yet so often we think there's just two. And yet on the flip side of it, Spiritually speaking, in the kingdom of God, so many times we think there are a lot of different options, a lot of different parties, if you will, within the kingdom of God, and, and we don't truly understand that there are only two parties in this kingdom, that there are really only two options for every single person in this place, listening online, every person in the world. We have the, the saved or the lost. We have those that are alive or dead. We have, as Jesus put it in one of his parables, we have the sheep or the goats, those that are for God or against God. And as we're going to see today in our passage, if you want to go ahead and open up to Luke chapter 23, we're going to see that you're either on the right side of the cross or the wrong side. Because in this passage, what we're going to see is, is Jesus there crucified, and on either side of him a criminal, and one ends up on the right side and one on the wrong. And I want us to see and leave here today understanding that there are only two parties, two options in the kingdom of God. There's no neutral party. Although so many times people think, well, I'm not, I'm not for God, I'm not really against him, I'm just kind of in this, this neutral spot. There's no undecided party. There's no halfway party. There's no sometimes but not all the time. There's no my daddy was a deacon party. There's no I'll think about it later. You're in one of these two camps. There are those that are in Christ and forgiven of their sins and those that are against Christ and dead in their sins. And we're going to see these two played out in Luke 23. If you were here last week, we were in Luke chapter 22, and we talked about how we looked at this, this battleground in the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus was there, and he was praying, he was fighting, and this temptation was there, and we talked about how we can overcome the battles in our lives through Christ in us. And then if you were to continue reading on in chapter 22 and 23, Jesus was arrested and betrayed. He was brought before the high priest, had this joke of a mock trial. He was taken before the religious leaders and the council of elders in Israel. 
He was passed off to Pilate. He was sent over to Herod. He was brought back to Pilate. Pilate's tried to release him. Pilate believes, I mean, there's nothing wrong with this guy, but in order to keep the mob down, he says, all right, I know what I'll do. I normally release a prisoner to them, and so I'm going to put Jesus up against this guy, Barabbas, and this Barabbas, he's a bad dude. There's no way they're going to pick Barabbas to go free, and yet that's exactly who they picked to go free. And then Jesus is scourged and beaten, and now he's carried across to Golgotha. He's had nails driven into his wrists and his feet, and he is hanging on a cross, dying for our sins. And in the middle of this, even in the middle of just the most heinous, crazy crucifixion and death of our Savior, we see God's grace and love poured out on one of these criminals. Let's look at this. Luke 23 Verse 39, while they are hanging there, one of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourselves and us. But the other, the other criminal rebuked, the other criminal, not Jesus in this, and the other one rebuked him saying, do you not fear God since you're under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward for our deeds. But this man, this man has done nothing wrong. And he said to Jesus, Jesus, would you remember me when you come into your kingdom? And Jesus looks at him and said, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity that Lord like this criminal this robber this bandit this revolutionary this evil working man had no right to be able to ask this a beggar coming into the presence of a king and yet you allowed it and you poured out your love and your grace in saving him and you have on many of us as well God, I pray everyone here would leave here on the right side of the cross today. That they would see Jesus for who he really is, what he has done, and for the forgiveness that he offers. God, transform us, save us. May your Holy Spirit work in and through us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray together. Amen. So, if there are only two parties in this kingdom, how do we make sure we're in the correct camp? As we look at this story here and we see one criminal on one side and one on the other, one blaspheming and railing and cursing and spitting and one being converted, how do we end up on the right side of the cross as well? How do we end up on that correct side and receive that forgiveness, the hope we need? Let's look at this, uh, this passage a little deeper. And I believe we see that on the right side of the cross, number one, it means we're changed from cursing to confessing. And when we read these verses, that I feel like it can be easy to skip over, but there's a ton packed in here that we see that first step of ending up on the right side of the cross is that we are changed from cursing to confessing. Verse 39, one of the criminals who were hanged railed at him. He's spewing hatred and just vile comments and questions this whole time there. But we see something different in the other one. Luke here, he calls them criminals. The criminals who were hanged there. In the Greek, it most literally means evil working men. These were bad dudes, and they had been for most of their life. And so these evil working men are now paying for their sins and this price on the cross. And the one there on the wrong side is cursing Christ. He's just overflowing with this hatred there. It says in verse 39 in the ESV, railed. Some of your translations may say he hurled insults. I love that imagery in the picture of just him hurling these insulting comments and questions spewing hateful, sarcastic things at Christ. The one question that Luke records for us is, are you not the Christ? 
Are you not the anointed one, the Messiah, the one that that we thought was coming to save us? If you are, save yourselves and us. But what he's really saying in those questions is you're not God. He's saying you're not the Christ. You're not the one we thought you were, or at least the one you said you were. You can't save us. You can't save yourself. You can't do what you said you were going to do. And you're not worthy of worship. You're not worthy of adoration. You're not worthy of praise. You're worthy of being railed at. You're worthy of this blasphemy that I'm throwing at you. You're getting what you truly deserve. And when we think about that on the surface, you can kind of be shocked, kind of shake our heads. I can look around the room, and as I'm saying those things, you know, kind of see a bewildered look on some of your faces, like, how could he do this? How could he say and do these things to the only hope that he has that's right before him? But in reality, that's the way many of us live our lives. And we're kind of shocked by that and think, no, 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 no. I don't, I don't spew hatred like that towards God. I, I don't spit at God like that. But many times, that's the way we live our lives. In our attitudes, in our actions, what we're saying to God is, I don't think you're really big enough. I don't think you're really strong enough, powerful enough. I don't think you can do what you said you can do. In fact, Paul wrote and told us in Romans chapter 8, verse 7, for the sinful nature that we're in apart from Christ, the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's law, and it never will. That's where we get confused so many times and think, well, I'm not for him, but I'm not against him. I'm just kind of neutral. No, in our sin, we are hostile towards God. We are enemies with God. And while Jesus is in the middle of sacrificing himself to save these criminals, this guy's too busy cursing God. And he misses everything that's being done for him right before him. Many of you have probably heard the name Voltaire. It was the pen name for a a French writer and philosopher in the 16 and 1700s. He he wrote some 20,000 letters, over 2,000 pamphlets and books. He was very well known as a writer and philosopher in his day. But one of the topics that he cursed the most, that he was just completely against and wanted to spew hatred and blasphemies towards, was Christianity. And he especially despised the Word of God, the holy book of Christianity. In fact, in 1764, he wrote and he said this of the Bible. He said, the Bible, that is what fools have written, what imbeciles commend, and what rogues teach. It's what young children are made to learn at heart. But he went on and said, but we are living in the twilight of Christianity thinking in his time that the sun is setting on Christianity and finally we're going to be awakened enough and enlightened enough and have enough knowledge and wisdom in and of ourselves that we don't need this old, outdated religion. It's told that in 1776 he would arrogantly say, 100 years from now, from my day, there will not be a Bible on earth except for the ones that will be looked upon by an antiquarian curiosity seeker. Saying 100 years from now, you're not going to be reading Bibles. You might see one in a museum that somebody wants to look at, but it's not going to be studied and remembered and lived by. And yet here we are, 244 years after that comment, and I'm holding one of the countless copies of God's Word that is still alive and well in the world today. That even in the middle of 2020 and COVID-19, Bible sales are higher than they've ever been. You know why? Because people are looking for hope. They're looking for truth. They're looking for something to to really live their lives based off of. I read this week that Tyndall Publishing reported that sales of Bibles are up 44% this year. Lifeway Bible sales up 62%. Alabaster Printing said that their Bible sales are up 143%. And yet he said 100 years from now, it'll be gone. Voltaire and his railing and blaspheming, but in God's sense of humor, it was only about 50 years after his death that the very house in which he lived and wrote many of these blasphemies was owned by the Evangelical Society of Geneva. 
And it was used as a warehouse for, guess what? Bibles and gospel tracts. The very printing presses that Voltaire used to print his blasphemous writings were now being used to print Bibles and tracts for his country. Voltaire died in his cursing, in his railing against and blaspheming God. So did this criminal on the wrong side of the cross. But there's another side of the cross, amen? There's hope that we can see in this criminal's life, hope for us in ours. Because you see, on the other side, we see a, a criminal who is offering a confession of his conversion. Look at this. We, we see change taking place in this criminal's life. We see confession and conversion. Verse 40, but the other criminal rebuked him, saying, do you not fear God? Since you were under the same sentence of condemnation, and we indeed justly, we're getting what we deserve, but he is completely innocent. I want you to write down Matthew 27, 44. I want you to be able to go and to be able to look and to see just kind of the, the overall perspective of Matthew's accounts because it gives us a picture of how this criminal was converted, that he was changed while he was on the cross. Because if you look at that verse, it tells us, it says, and the robbers in the ESV. Maybe your translation says criminals or thieves or revolutionaries. But whatever it says, it's plural. So in Matthew, there was at one point where he's saying, look, both of the robbers were hurling insults at Jesus at one point. Both of these men, when they first were hung there, were, were questioning and calling out and spewing this hate, but then something changed. While he was there on the cross, he was converted. He saw Jesus for who he really was. He was transformed, and he confesses that in what he said. Now, how was he changed? How could this happen? How could someone who was moments away from death and eternity, who was cursing at Christ on the cross, how could he be changed? There's nobody there preaching, is there? There's nobody praying for him at the foot of his cross. There's nobody witnessing, right? You might think that, but really there were. Jesus was doing that. Jesus was preaching through his actions and his words. Jesus was praying specifically for all of those around them and witnessing to them the love and the hope of God. It was Jesus' kindness that led to this transformation and repentance. Romans 2 verse 4 says, Do you not see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Can you, can you not see that? Does this mean nothing to you, Paul wrote? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? In other words, his kindness is meant to lead to repentance. We see this kindness if you just back up a little ways in Luke chapter 23. Look there at Luke 23 verse 34, and it says, And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That this criminal sees this Jesus praying for their forgiveness in the middle of all their hostility. And one of the things that we can kind of skip over in the English text and miss out on is that if you look at the Greek, really, in the Greek that's written here, it implies that Jesus kept repeating these words over and over and over again. So when they would spit in his face, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. When they would hurl those insults and mockings and blasphemies, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And when they laughed and when they were driving the nails in his wrists and his feet, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. When the, when the cross was settled into place and pain would have shot through every nerve in his body, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Over and over and over again, this criminal would have heard, but everything we do to him, all he responds with is, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And in that moment, he has to know, this is not the response of a normal man. This is the response of the Son of God. He is who he says he was. And this conversion leads to his confession. Look at those verses. Look at what he says, starting in verse 40 believe in these just two, three quick verses, he packs in at least five confessions of things that Jesus was. He says in, in these verses that Jesus is God. He says that Jesus is innocent. He says that these criminals are guilty, that Jesus is king, 
and that he would rise again. He says that there. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God? You're speaking to God in the flesh right now. This is the Son of God. And look, we're here because of our sins. We deserve to be here. We're guilty, but he is completely innocent. And then he says to him, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Who rules and reigns in kingdoms? Kings do. And he's on a Roman cross that you don't get off of without dying. And so this other criminal realizes in this that, yes, all those things Jesus said, he's going to die on this cross, but he's going to rise again. And he's going to rule and reign in his kingdom. And what an amazing example of what our response has to be to Jesus. We come to him confessing that he is God that he is perfect and holy and we are not, that he is the risen king and we need him to make it into the kingdom. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. This criminal got it. He ends up on the right side of the cross. And the question is, have you? Have you confessed those things? If you come to see the kindness of Christ and what he's done for you and, and been converted to confess that, yes, Jesus is God. He is innocent. I am guilty. He is the risen king, and I need him for all of eternity. The second thing we see on the right side of the cross is when we're on the right side of the cross, we focus on eternity and not the earthly. When we are on the right side of the cross, all the things of this world begin to fade away, and what really matters is eternity. We begin to live for what ultimately matters. This one on the wrong side, he says, are you not the Christ? Save us and yourself. What he's saying is physically get us off of these crosses so we don't have to endure this physical pain, this humiliation. Save us for the here and now. But the one on the right side of the cross says, Jesus, remember me in the then and there. To understand that That's what ultimately matters. That eternity is what must be our priority. Pastor Erwin Lutzer put it this way. He said, this thief's problem was that he only cared about this life and not the next. There was no remorse for his sins, only distress that what he was suffering was the consequences of them. Whereas the criminal on the right realizes that what ultimately matters is not what I'm dealing with temporarily, but where I'm going to spend eternity. And how often do we see that in people's lives? Where the earthly, where the here and now, where the temporal, where the physical, where that's all that's worried about. What a better time to see that take place in people's lives than in an election year, right? When you see them just moaning and groaning and he and hawing and just complaining, like, what's going to happen if this person's elected or if this person's elected and what's the future going to be like? And we're so stressed out and overwhelmed by now. Instead of focusing on and caring about then. That Paul wrote and told us that these light and momentary afflictions... He's meaning anything and everything that we could go through here on this earth. He says they're light and they're momentary and they pale in comparison to the glory that awaits us in eternity. To get your mind off of the earth and to set it on things that are above. And we see that take place in this criminal. Even if it's just for a few moments, we see his mentality completely transformed. What would it have profited the criminal on the wrong side of Jesus would have gotten him down physically. What would it have profited him? He got a couple more years of living on earth, but didn't change his eternity. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? C.S. Lewis once wrote and said, if you live for the next world, meaning heaven, meaning a new heaven and a new earth, that which is to come, If you live for the next world, you get this one in the deal. But if you live only for this world, you lose them both. I pray that you would be changed and moved to the right side of the cross today. 
that you would confess who Jesus is, be transformed, and to see him change your heart and mind to the eternal and not just what's here on earth. Finally, being on the right side of the cross means that we receive paradise instead of punishment. We receive paradise instead of the punishment that we really deserve. And he said to him, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, now isn't this incredible? He has no right to ask Jesus for anything. You don't deserve this at all. No room for this beggar to come into the presence of this king and to to remember him when you come into your kingdom. And yet Jesus looks at him and says, truly, I say to you, personal, intimate, directly at him, I'm saying to you because you have asked me, today you will be with me in paradise. I love the way one commentator I read put it when he said, Jesus answered the second criminal far beyond his expectations. The thief on the cross had some distant time in mind. Jesus told him today. The thief on the cross asked only to be remembered, and Jesus said, you're not just going to be remembered, you will be with me. The thief on the cross looked only for a kingdom, and Jesus promised him paradise. Bliss. Did you notice what it took for this criminal salvation. Did you see what he had to do to get into paradise with Jesus? Confessing, repenting, believing. He's never going to get an opportunity for church attendance, right? Never going to go visit the synagogue. Never going to be in the temple again. He, he, he doesn't have any Bible verses memorized or is going to memorize them. He's not going to be baptized. He's never going to take communion. He's not going to get to go on a mission trip. And he's never going to give a tithe check. None of these things that so often we think, if I just do a little bit more of this, then God will be happier with me. And maybe I can earn my way into heaven. He's never going to do anything. He confessed He repented. There's a changing of a mind. There's a believing in Jesus for who he is. And I think this story is the most beautiful picture of Ephesians 2, 8, 9 ever lived out. When Paul writes and tells us, For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of your own doing. It's a gift of God, not the result of works. Why? So that no one can boast. This criminal is saved in the same way that you and I are saved, by grace, through faith in Jesus. Believing in him for who he said he was, what he did, and what he promises to do. Many of you have probably heard of Auschwitz, probably studied it in history. Maybe some of you have visited this former Nazi concentration camp. It's estimated that at Auschwitz and in its joint camps that over a million Jews were gassed to death during the Holocaust. Millions and millions of lives destroyed in this place. And if you were to visit it today, they still have the the original gate that you would go through. And and above this gate in, in iron, you have this message that the prisoners would see as they first arrived. In that gate are the German words, Arbit macht frei. Translated into English, it says, work will make you free. It was propaganda that the Nazis had put there to think, okay, if we can get these, these prisoners as they're coming into gates to see this message, work will make you free. That if you just try hard enough, If you just put in enough energy and effort, if you just really bust it, you can earn your way out of here. You can fight and win your freedom if you impress one of the guards and officers. And as a result, many of the captives bought into the lie. Countless Jews literally broke their backs trying to impress the Nazi soldiers because of Arbit Machfrei. Work will make me free. They bought into the propaganda and the lie of the enemy that if you just work harder, you'll get released. 
the truth was that their work was never going to buy their freedom. What it was actually gonna lead to was their death. And we have an enemy that tries to keep us in the prison of thinking work will make you free. It's called religion. Try harder, do more good, tip the scales in your favor. Be a good little boy and girl. Say this, do that, go there. Then it'll make you free. But it never will. Just like in that concentration camp, it only led to our death, it, it only leads to our death. It breaks our backs, it breaks our hearts, it breaks our souls, it breaks our minds. See people coming into church all the time who are still trying to earn it and they're so tired. But Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You know why? Because he carried all the weight. He carried it to the cross. He died in our place and we are saved by grace, through faith, not of works. We confess to who he is. We repent of our sins and we're turned away from sin into a savior and we believe in him. Jesus' first words as he's opening his ministry in the Gospel of Mark is the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe. It's always been the message. It always will be. Your head's bowed and your eyes closed. I'll close with the question I started with. Which party are you in? Which camp are you in? Which side of the cross are you on? Are you on the right side of the cross? The correct side of the cross? The, the, the side of the cross where we are changed by his kindness? From cursing to confessing who he truly is. The side of the cross where we go from focused on just the earthly to focusing on eternity side of the cross where we can have freedom and know that we have been changed from punishment to paradise. You know, what this story tells me that is that no matter where you're from, no matter what you've done, no matter when it was, what this story tells us is that it's never too late and you're never too lost for Jesus to save you. Your heart's still beating, your lungs are still breathing, it's never too late. And you're never too lost. So, just you and God, whether you're in this room or whether you're watching online, is there anyone here who says today, for the first time, I want to make sure that I'm on the right side of the cross. If that's you, would you just lift your hand up right where you sit? You say, I want to be on the right side of the cross. Forgiven, freed, saved by grace through faith. That you want to make Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior for the first time. If that's your heart, would you just lift your hand to heaven right where you sit so I can give you some more instructions? Amen. Praise God. If you're one of those people, right where you sit, from your heart to God, if if you think about what this guy said, it wasn't a great prayer, was it? I mean, look at it and think, is, this, is that even the right words? <laughs> but it wasn't about his words, it was about his heart. God could see, God knew that he was changed and transformed there on the cross. That he was confessing who Jesus was, and he was repenting of his sins, and he was believing in him for his salvation. Putting all of his faith on Christ for his eternity. So if that's you, right where you sit, I want you to just cry out to God. Pray in your own words. Say, God, I believe 
that Jesus is the Son of God. That right now, through your Holy Spirit's power, I understand that I am a sinner and I am in need of a Savior. And that Jesus was that sinless Savior. I believe he died on a cross. I believe he rose again. I believe he's the returning King of Kings. And I want him to be my Lord and Savior from this point forward. God, save me and remember me when you come into your kingdom. And just like he said to that criminal, he will say to you that you will be with him in paradise. Your life will be transformed from this day forward as you follow him on this journey. And yes, that criminal never had those opportunities to do all those things, but all those things I listed were not bad things. But they are not things that we do in order to receive God's love. We do all of those things in response to God's love that we have already freely received. That we want to be in a community of faith with other believers. That we want to serve God. That we want to live generously as a response to who Jesus is and what he's done in our lives. Father, may we all live every day on the right side of the cross. Confessing you as Lord showing that in our attitudes and our actions and everything we do, not just with our mouths. God, living our lives focused on eternity and not just what is the earthly. And God, living lives of gratitude and joy and worship that we have been changed from punishment to paradise. That as your word says in Colossians, we have been transferred the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of your glorious light. We thank you for that. We praise you for that. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.